so as we can appreciate over here this is the diagram this is the bone okay and over here this is the cartilage as we can appreciate over here this is the cartilage okay and the cartilage over here is this is the normal joint as we can appreciate but what happens in case of rheumatoid arthritis let us try and understand so there is an inflammation as we can understand there is a triggering there is a genetic susceptibility and environmental factor is there so there is stimulation of our, in, our immune system so all the inflammatory cells are collection including the macrophages the neutrophils okay and the immune complex they go and start to deposit and what happens over there in the process of this inflammation so all the inflammatory cells along with the tissue they form an edematous mass comprising of granulation tissue comprising of all the inflammatory cells as we can appreciate over here and this mass is called as a pannus as we can appreciate in this diagram and this is a pathological lesion that we see in case of rheumatoid arthritis so as initially we have seen that at the level of the wrist joint there is a radial deviation whereas at the level of the fingers there is an ulnar deviation along with that if you see there is a diffuse osteopenia you can see blackishness very easily you can see blackishness now around the periarticular region you can see bony erosions around the periarticular and you can see the joint space if you look at the joint space okay the joint space is itself it is very much reduced so there's a marked loss of joint space between of the carpal so in between these muscles also you cannot see the joint space in in the metacarpal uh, you know bones as well as in the phalanges and interphalangeal joints and all these joint spaces if you see myself dr jibran amath presents to you simply pathology and today we are back with a very important lecture today we are going to start with a very awaited topic arthritis and we are going to discuss in details about rheumatoid arthritis so first of all let us try to understand what is arthritis so arthritis as you can see it refers to inflammation of the joints now arthritis can be divided into many types so the basic classification of arthritis includes number 1 osteoarthritis number 2 rheumatoid arthritis now clinically if you see osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis are clinically the more important variety other types include juvenile idiopathic arthritis zero negative spondyloarthropathies that includes ankylosing spondylitis and reactive arthritis infectious arthritis that includes suppurative arthritis mycobacterial arthritis viral arthritis and lyme's disease lastly we are having crystal induced arthritis which is including gout as well as its differential diagnosis pseudo gout so before we start as we have seen that there are two clinically very important varieties of uh, uh, arthritis that we see one is your osteoarthritis another one is your rheumatoid arthritis so if you see over here the basic points of difference between the two the primary pathological abnormality in osteoarthritis is mechanical injury bio biochemical mechanical injury to the articular cartilage that is the starting point of osteoarthritis whereas for rheumatoid arthritis it is autoimmunity now the role of infl inflammation is quite limited in osteoarthritis and the role is quite secondary inflammatory mediators might exacerbate cartilage damage but inflammation as such is not playing a major role in osteoarthritis whereas in case of rheumatoid arthritis if you see inflammation is playing a major primary role now cartilage destruction occurs due to the t cells as well as the antibodies which are reactive against the self joint antigens namely the ccps the joints which are involved primarily the larger joints the weight bearing joints like the knees and the hip joint is classically involved in osteoarthritis whereas rheumatoid arthritis also involves the larger joints but the disease is beginning and initially is involving the smaller joints of the hands and feet okay and later on it progresses to involve the larger joints like the knees hip elbow joint that occurs later on not initially pathology wise if you see in case of osteoarthritis there is a cartilage degeneration and fragmentation along with that you can see bony spur formation subchondral cyst formation along with that there is minimal amount of inflammation whereas in case of rheumatoid arthritis if you see there is inflammatory pannus formation which invades and destroys the entire cartilage there is a severe chronic inflammation that we can appreciate and often it is characterized by joint fusion which can both be 
uh, fibrous as well as bony in nature. So respectively, we call it as fibrous ankylosis or bony ankylosis. If we see over here, in case of osteoarthritis, there is no serum antibodies present. So there is no role of serology in case of osteoarthritis. Whereas uh, in case of uh, rheumatoid arthritis, you have anti-citrullinated uh, uh, peptide uh, antibodies. Okay, and you also have antibodies against the uh, uh, rheumatoid. Uh, you know, uh, IgG and IgM antibodies are there against the FC tail of IgG. So these are basically forming the rheumatoid factors. Okay, so auto antibodies are present in case of rheumatoid arthritis, and they play an important diagnostic role. Now, involvement of other organs is classically not seen in osteoarthritis, whereas it is very much present in case of rheumatoid arthritis, especially the lungs, hearts and other organs are involved. So with this, we have got a basic idea of the point of difference between osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis. And with this background in our mind, we are going to start our topic of discussion that is rheumatoid arthritis. So if we are going to see over here uh, about rheumatoid arthritis, it is basically a chronic autoimmune disorder. Okay, It is a chronic autoimmune disorder which is principally attacking the joints okay and very importantly this is creating a non-suppurative proliferative inflammatory synovitis so there is a component of proliferation there is a component of inflammation but it is non-suppurative in nature there is no suppuration over here it is characterized by articular cartilage destruction and joint fusion that is called as ankylosis. There are two types. One is initially there will be fibrous ankylosis which is going to ossify over a period of time giving rise to bony ankylosis. Not only the, the bones are involved but there is an extra articular involvement in contrast to osteoarthritis. So in rheumatoid arthritis in addition to the bones the skin, heart, blood vessels along with the lungs will be involved. Now, incidence, it occurs in a younger age group as compared to osteoarthritis. So, the age group involved is second to the fourth decade and it is far more common to, uh, in females. So, the ratio is 3 is to 1. So, it is 3 times more common in women as compared to men. Coming to the pathogenesis of rheumatoid arthritis, as we have already discussed that broadly, if we consider it is an autoimmune uh, you know, disease. It is mainly initiated and propagated by the CD4 plus helper T cell. So this is the major villain or major protagonist in rheumatoid arthritis. Along with that, there is some genetic as well as environmental predisposition as well. So these, uh, you know, with the help of, you know, genetic susceptibility genes and environmental factors helps in the development, progression and persistence of the disease. Now, how does CD4 plus T cell cause this? Let us see. The CD4 plus T cells, as we already know from the basic concept, they are the commissioner of the police. They themselves are not going to do anything, but they release a plethora of cytokines, which cause many pathological changes. So these cytokines, they also stimulate antibody secretion from the plasma cells. And these antibodies, they act against the self-antigen. Not only that, the cytokines are also inducing uh, inflammation. So both the antibodies along with the cytokine mediated inflammation is responsible for the pathological changes of rheumatoid arthritis or we can say that they are responsible for the tissue injury in case of rheumatoid arthritis. So let us see some of the important cytokine mediators. So the T helper 1 and T helper 17 as we know they are nothing but they are subset of CD4 plus T cell. So the T helper 1 cells they release interferon gamma which is uh, active in activation of the macrophages along with the synovial cells and that also stimulates the synovial cell proliferation that we see in case of rheumatoid arthritis. The T helper 17 cells are releasing interleukin 17 whose major function is to recruit the neutrophils and monocytes and once they are recruited at the particular site then there will be inflammation because they will release the reactive oxygen species so inflammation and tissue injury is going to continue. Also, the rank L ligand is expressed on the activated T cells, which is stimulating bone resorption, okay, by stimulating osteoclast activation. Now, very importantly, if you see, then the TNF and the interleukin 1, okay, they are released from the macrophages and uh, both of them, they stimulate the resident synovial cells to secrete proteases that is causing destruction of the hyaline cartilage. So, very importantly, both the, tu the tumor necrosis factor along with the interleukin 1 released by the macrophages, they stimulate the resident synovial cells to secrete the proteases that is going to destroy the hyaline cartilage. 
single handedly always remember that tnf is the most firmly implicated cytokine in the pathogenesis of rheumatoid arthritis so if you have to choose one mcq out of interleukin 1 and tnf tnf will become the answer it is the most important cytokine involved in the pathogenesis of rheumatoid arthritis okay. Now, let us see what is happening in case of rheumatoid arthritis. The synovium in the rheumatoid arthritis, they develop collections of lymphoid cells and they develop germinal centers. Okay, they develop germinal centers. So, there is a lot of proliferation of the B cells taking place in the germinal centers. Plus, in, uh, in the other lymphoid organs, in the lymph nodes as well, there is a proliferation of the B cells or there is formation of germinal centers. This leads to an excessive amount of plasma cells secreting autoantibodies and these autoantibodies, unfortunately, they are directed against self-proteins. And what are these self-proteins? These self-proteins are nothing but the citrullinated peptides, okay, which is classically uh, post-translationally uh, post modified wherein the arginine is replaced by citrulline. So, whatever the case, the self-protein is this CCP, that is the citrullinated peptide. And this peptide and this protein is classically found in joints, okay? Like, the, you know, like in the joint components, like the fibrinogen, type 2 collagen, vimentin, alpha enolase, which are components of the joint proteins. So, they contain the citrullinated peptide against which the autoantibodies are formed. And that is responsible for the pathogenesis and inflammation of rheumatoid arthritis. Now, the serology of rheumatoid arthritis is very diagnostic and very important. So, there are two important kinds of antibodies that we see over here. One is the anti-citrullinated peptide antibody, that is antibody directed against the citrullinated peptides, which is present in the joint proteins, also called as ACPAs. Now, what is the very important point that these are highly diagnostic of rheumatoid arthritis and they are highly specific antibodies. It is seen in serum of 70% of patients suffering from rheumatoid arthritis. Arthritis. One other autoantibody that we see is a rheumatoid factor, which is nothing but the IgG, IgM, and IgA autoantibody that is binding to the FC portion of the IgG. It is present in 80% of the individuals, but it is not very specific and it is not diagnostic. Okay. Now, around 50% patients, you know, there is a risk of development of rheumatoid arthritis is related to inherited genetic susceptibility, as I was saying. And uh, in that, the HLA-DR4 allele is associated with ACPA positive rheumatoid arthritis. So, in patients who are having positivity for anti-citrullinated uh, peptide antibody, those patients, they have a genetic predisposition and they have this HLA-DR4 allele. Now, environmental factors like infection and smoking, they are also, you know, thought to promote citrullination of self-proteins and thus, they are also thought to be contributing towards the formation of autoantibodies. So, to summarize the pathogenesis in one particular slide, the presence of genetic susceptibility genes like the HLA-DR4 as we have seen as well as the environmental factors. So, the susceptibility gene might lead to failure of tolerance and unregulated lymphocyte activation. Along with that, environmental factors might cause modification of cell protein, that is they might cause citrullination. All these might stimulate the T and B self response to the self antigens. Okay. So, as we have already seen, the T helper 1 releasing interferon gamma, the T helper 17 releasing interleukin 17, then the antibodies that are basically stimulated by the CD4 plus T cells. So, all of them, okay, they are forming an inflammatory reaction wherein the lymphocytes, antibodies, and the immune complexes is, are entering the joint, leading to you know, fibroblast proliferation, chondrocyte proliferation, synovial cell activation is there, which ultimately leads to the pathogenic panus formation. And ultimately, in the end, there is a destruction of the bone and cartilage that is taking place. Coming to the morphology of rheumatoid arthritis, if we see the rheumatoid arthritis is affecting the smaller joints of the hands and feet, most importantly. So, grossly, if we see the synovium becomes grossly edematous. They are thickened and they become hyperplastic because of the stimulation, okay, because of the stimulation and activation that is there by the inflammatory cells. The smooth contour of the cartilage is converted into a bulbous villi. So, let us look at the characteristic histological features that we see in case of rheumatoid arthritis. So, as we have already seen, there is a synovial cell hyperplasia along with proliferation. There is a dense inflammatory uh, infiltrate 
and they are even forming lymphoid follicles. There is an increased vascularity because of increased angiogenesis. A fibropurulent exudate is forming on the synovial and joint surfaces. Osteoclastic activity in the subchondral bone is also increasing, allowing the inflamed synovium to penetrate the bone and cause periarticular erosions and subchondral cyst formation. All the above inflammatory changes leads to a formation of a substance which is called as a panus. What is a panus? A panus is nothing but it is a mass of edematous hypertrophied synovium along with that inflammatory cells, granulation tissue, fibroblast and the macrophages. So this panus tissue is going to grow over and cause erosion of the articular cartilage. Now, once the articular cartilage destruction is there, so once the cartilage is destroyed, then the panus, that is the that is the inflammatory tissue that we see, it tries to bridge the opposing bones. So it will going to bring the opposing bones towards each other. And initially, there will be a fibrous fusion of the joints that is called as fibrous oncolysis. And, uh, and that is followed by ossification leading to bony fusion that is called as bony ankylosis. This is a very, very important point. So before I discuss anything else, let me just show you this diagram. So this becomes very crystal clear to everyone. So as we can appreciate over here, this is the diagram. This is the bone. Okay. And over here, this is the cartilage as we can appreciate over here. This is the cartilage. Okay. And the cartilage over here is, this is the normal joint as we can appreciate. But what happens in case of rheumatoid arthritis, let us try and understand. So there is an inflammation as we can understand, there is a triggering, there is a genetic susceptibility, environmental factor is there. So there is stimulation of our, in, our immune system. So all the inflammatory cells are collection, including the macrophages, the neutrophils, okay, and the immune complex, they go and start to deposit. And what happens over there in the process of this inflammation, so all the inflammatory cells along with the tissue, they form an edematous mass comprising of granulation tissue, comprising of all the inflammatory cells as we can appreciate over here. And this mass is called as a panus as we can appreciate in this diagram. And this is a pathological lesion that we see in case of rheumatoid arthritis comprising of a mass of tissue, edematous synovial tissue, comprising of inflammatory cells, granulation tissue, okay, and which is responsible for the destructive lesion. As you can appreciate, there is a synovial cell hyperplasia in a way. So this is the synovial cell hyperplasia that is basically leading to the formation of a bulbous villi. Can you appreciate the synovial cell hyperplasia is so strong that they are giving rise to some villi. Okay. And beneath that, if we can appreciate over here, just beneath that, there is so much of inflammation and collection of lymphocyte that they are forming what is called as lymphoid follicles. So there is a characteristic formation of lymphoid follicles as we can appreciate. This is another lymphoid follicle as we can see. This is another lymphoid follicle collection of lymphoid cells as we can see. Okay. And over here on the upper end, there is a synovial cell hyperplasia and edema that is there. Okay. And there is a lot of lymphoid cell, you know, accumulation that we can appreciate in this diagram. Now, this is the classical picture wherein we can see the classical panus formation as we can appreciate over here the panus okay so we can see over here the synovial cell hypertrophy that has occurred okay and the synovium there is containing a lot of edema so there's an edematous okay so edematous synovial hypertrophy is there now beneath this is beneath this is the synovial hypertrophy now beneath the synovial Okay, there is a mass of dense lymphocyte aggregate. So the majority of the cells, they are the lymphocytes forming the lymphoid follicles. And they are also comprising some macrophages within them, some plasma cells as we can appreciate within them, some granulation tissue with, you know, uh, you know, increased angiogenesis and there is an, you know, dilated blood vessels as we can appreciate. Then there might be fibroblast over here. Okay, so all these tissue, okay, there is an intense lymphocyte aggregate that we can appreciate over here and all these together, they form what is called as a panus, okay, which is a classical pathological lesion that is seen in rheumatoid arthritis. Now, this is one of the classical lesions. Now, there is one more lesion that is very commonly seen in case of uh, of uh, rheumatoid arthritis that is the formation of rheumatoid nodules now what is a rheumatoid nodule it is basically these nodules are seen in the subcutaneous tissues of the forearm elbow occiput and lumbosacral region now these are firm non-tender round to oval nodules that we see 
Now, if you see microscopically, if you see, these are necrotizing granulomas with central zone of fibrinoid necrosis surrounded by a very prominent rim of inflammatory cells comprising activated macrophages, plasma cells along with the lymphocytes. So if you look in the diagram over here, there is a very beautiful diagram. So this is a very beautiful diagram of rheumatoid nodule that we can appreciate. So there is a central area, as you can appreciate, a central area of necrosis is there, and which is also called as a fibrinoid necrosis, which is basically, classically, it is surrounded by the inflammatory cells, okay, comprising of the macrophages, lymphocytes, as we can appreciate in this diagram, the classical rheumatoid nodule, which is also seen sometimes in case of rheumatoid arthritis. So with this, we have completed the morphology of rheumatoid arthritis, as we have seen. Next, we are going to understand, okay, before we come to the clinical features, we have to understand that sometimes the rheumatoid uh, arthritis can become a very severe disease. And it, in that situation, it might be associated with what is called as a leukocytoclastic vasculitis, which is an acute necrotizing vasculitis involving the small and larger arteries. It might give rise to purpura, cutaneous ulcers, nail bed infarction, ocular changes like uveitis, as well as keratoconjunctivitis can occur. Sometimes it might involve the lungs, pleura as well. Coming to the last leg of today's lecture, that is the clinical features of rheumatoid arthritis. Now, you should always remember that the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis is depending on two things. One is the serology, wherein we have seen that antibodies against the citrullinated peptides, they are the most specific and they are diagnostic, okay? Others are like rheumatoid factors also there, but they are not very specific. And there are certain radiological findings which I am going to shortly discuss. Now, the disease begins as malaise, fatigue and generalized musculoskeletal pain occurring in around 50% of the patients. So, initially, the disease is not having a sudden onset. It is having a very mild onset. Now, the joint involvement, it occurs after weeks to months of these symptoms. So, it doesn't occur at first. And what is the kind, what is the characteristic feature of the joint involvement that we see in case of rheumatoid arthritis? There is a bilateral, symmetrical involvement of the small joints of the hands and the feet. This occurs first. And this is very much in contrast to osteoarthritis. After this, this is followed by the involvement of the wrist, ankles, elbows and knees and after that the larger joints, the hip joints are involved later on. In the hands, the metacarpophalangeal joint along with the proximal interphalangeal joints are involved in contrast to osteoarthritis which is involving larger joints. Okay, Remember that the distal interphalangeal joint is not involved in rheumatoid arthritis. Now the involved joints, okay, they become swollen, they become warm and they become quite painful. Unlike osteoarthritis, remember, the morning joint stiffness does not subside with activity. So, even with activity, the pain of rheumatoid arthritis will not subside. Now, remember, as the disease progressive, there will be a progressive joint enlargement with decreased range of motion, okay, during a chronic waxing waning course, okay. 10% of the patients of rheumatoid arthritis can also have an acute onset rheumatoid arthritis. Now, we are going to understand the radiological features of osteoarthritis, which is, uh, sorry, the radiological features of rheumatoid arthritis, which is very characteristic. What you are going to appreciate that at the level of the wrist joint, there is a radial deviation. Whereas at the level of the fingers, okay, you will see there is an ulnar deviation. So, let me just clear out this diagram first. So, as we can appreciate, okay, so there is a radial deviation. If you see, it is towards this side. There is a radial deviation at the level of the wrist joint. Whereas at the level of the fingers, if you see, there is basically uh, uh, towards the medial aspect, you can see there's an ulnar deviation as we can appreciate at the level of the fingers. Ulnar deviation is there at the level of the fingers okay so this is the characteristic picture but this is not it there are many other features that we are going to discuss and we will come back to this particular diagram okay so there is a radial deviation of the wrist and ulnar deviation of the fingers 
Classically, they have two types of deformities, flexion extension deformities. One is called as Schwann neck deformity. Another is called as Boutonniere's deformity. So Schwann neck deformity is characterized by hyperextension of the proximal interphalangeal joints with flexion of the distal interphalangeal joint. Whereas Boutonniere's de uh, uh, deformity is just opposite, characterized by hyperextension of the distal interphalangeal joint and metacarpophalangeal joint along with the flexion of the proximal interphalangeal joint now you are advised to remember any one of them but not both else you will get confused okay so what are the hallmark features that you will see there will be joint effusion okay the joint will show some kind of effusion there is osteopenia there is erosion and narrowing of the joint space and there is loss of articular cartilage. These are the hallmark features of rheumatoid arthritis that we are going to appreciate. So as initially we have seen that at the level of the wrist joint, there is a radial deviation. Whereas at the level of the fingers, there is an ulnar deviation. Along with that, if you see, there is a diffuse osteopenia. You can see blackishness. Very easily you can see blackishness. Now around the periarticular region, you can see bony erosions around the periarticular. And you can see the joint space. If you look at the joint space, okay, the joint space is itself, it is very much reduced. So there's a marked loss of joint space between of the carpal. So in between these muscles also, you cannot see the joint space. In, in the metacarpal, uh, you know, bones as well as in the phalanges and interphalangeal joints. And all these joint spaces, if you see, the amount of joint space is markedly reduced. There's a diffuse osteopenia and there is a bony erosion. Around the cartilages periarticular, there is a bony erosion. That is a classical feature of rheumatoid arthritis. Okay. Now we have seen that there are these two deformities as we can appreciate. So over here you can see the proximal one is flat over here and the distal interphalangeal joint is flexed. Okay, So the distal interphalangeal joint, the distal interphalangeal joint as we can appreciate, it is flexed whereas the proximal interphalangeal joint as you can see it is hyperextended and this is called as the Schwann neck deformity and if you see there is another deformity called as Boutonniere's deformity which is just the reverse so over here that you see the proximal interphalangeal joint if you see that is classically uh, that is classically flexed whereas the distal interphalangeal joint along with the metacarpophalangeal joint both of them are hyperextended. Both of them are hyperextended as we can appreciate from this particular diagram. Now, coming to the treatment part. Now, as it is autoimmune disorder, so corticosteroids will form the mainstay of the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis and we have to give immunosuppressives like methotrexates. And now because TNF is the most important cytokine which is involved in the pathogenesis so TNF antagonists are classically used. But again, if you use TNF antagonists, there is also an increased risk of opportunistic infections, especially mycobacterial tuberculosis. With this, we have completed our discussion of rheumatoid arthritis.